is already lesson three of five in a series titled Footsteps of Faith. Now, we could have focused a little bit on Abraham and started on him, but he really deserves something, uh, a series of his own. So we'll do that a little bit later. But Footsteps of Faith, we began this journey with the Israelites crossing over the Jordan as they exited the wilderness and entered a new era of conquest of Canaan. We learned in that moment as well that as they were crossing Jordan, we saw how God's power and his presence was a quiet yet subtle reminder and present reminder of how he will be with us in every transition of life. We've just got to make sure to stay with him, follow his instructions, and he will bless us. Well, we also saw that we were marching around the city of Jericho, that well-fortified city, with the Israelites. In our minds, we were with them marching around, just as God told us to, so that we will have the victory. And we learned that it is by his power and his grace that those walls fell. But we had to obey. That reminded us that God blesses our yielding, trusting, active faith in him. <clears throat> Pardon. Also, regardless of the covenant, we also learned this. As we've studied since December and then the kickoff of January of our theme, we've learned that the method by which people are in, always blessed, the method by which God offers his conditional blessing has always been grace by faith. You think about that. We are in Hebrews, arcing back to the old covenant and how he fulfilled that covenant, yes, but even the people who obeyed the covenant in which they were given, it's always been grace by faith. And each account is really emphasizing that same message. That's how faith is the victory. That is how faith is the victory. If someone asks you, how is faith the victory? You can tell them it's by trusting and obeying in his power and grace. There's no other way but to trust and obey. So we will have the mindset today again emphasized, personified in another occasion, another occurrence uh, in the period of the judges. This idea of, Lord, I will go wherever you tell me. I love that mindset. Lord, here I am, send me. Wherever he leads, I will follow. One particular individual that we are going to focus on today wasn't so perfect in that mindset. And he, he didn't do all that was proper. However, God still granted the victory to the Israelites uh, as he said, because on the surface, yes, they did obey, but there was one person who, who, uh, who we can learn a lot of lessons from. Today, we're, ha we're having a different type of a lesson than what we normally have. We're going to talk in principles and general truths, but we're going to focus on one event today. Now, the, the last two lessons dealt with the period of the conquest. That was about 30 years of, his of history. But this lesson is based early in the period of the judges. And, of course, that span lasted for about 300 plus years of time. And we discussed that recently in Wednesday night. So, during this time, Israel was not following God like they should have. They should have been the evangelists for the world to draw more people to God. And yet, they weren't following God as they should as well. Like Ron said in his class, they kept following idols, being influenced by the people who God told them initially they should have justly wiped out by his judgment call. And when they didn't, consequences came. And we see this now being borne out. God would, however lovingly raise up judges, uh, also deliverers, to get them out of their oppression and the tribulation that they were facing by their disobedience. So we will notice Judges chapter 4 today. If you want to turn or tap to Judges chapter 4, that's where we will be, God's battle plan. This describes a battle in which we will learn how to better be a soldier for Christ, because no matter the battle, there are principles of strategies to win. And our key question in all of this is, will you faithfully follow what God tells you to do? And no matter the time, no matter the covenant, we're under Christ now. That's always the question. Will you follow what God has told you to do? And that is the key. And I tend to associate the word strategy with the game of chess. I just always have. That's how I link it up. So that's our background for the day. And with the Lord against his enemies, it's always checkmate. Isn't that right? With the Lord against his enemies, it's always checkmate. You can't win. There's, there's no competition. <clears throat> so here's the battle plan. Here's a map I want to show you to visualize the narrative and some images as well. <clears throat> of course, we're south of the land of Canaan, the Israelite area, and we see the arrow pointing to Mount Tabor, about 1,800 feet high above sea level. <clears throat> Sorry about this. <clears throat> 
I think it is my sinuses running today, so pardon that. Mount Tabor is the high ground that you see in this image. It's uh, at a distance, looks small. It's not, okay? So beautiful images there. At a good time, this is the Jordan, uh, not the Jordan, I'm sorry. This is the Kishon River, very important to our story. And uh, it's representing the area where Sisera was defeated and they could not cross. So here is the topographic view. And I did those arrows quite a while ago with a different study. I, I used an old uh, document here for this, and I thought, let's have some fun. It's sentimental to me. But here's a fun little story marked by the arrows. I'm going to go over play by play. Normally, I save the unexpected twist ending for later, but it's not that type of a lesson. Uh, so I will share with you the narrative now and some of those geographic uh, historical facts. This is the map, and the red lines represent the Canaanite movements. The blue represents the Israelite forces in this case. And this is the sequence of battle. The Israelites assemble near Mount Tabor towards the right, with, uh, comprised of two tribes and some volunteer forces. The Canaanites assemble near Megiddo, might sound familiar to you, but many of the north cities as well as commanded by Sisera. The Israelites take the high ground that does give them the advantage. Canaanites rush to crush the Israelites below the Tabor mountain hill, but the chariots could not climb the mountain. That was obvious. So, interesting story as it plays out. The Israelites wait for a rainy day, which was to come, and then they attack from Mount Tabor. The Canaanite forces break in panic. The chariots run into the mud, and the Kishon River blocks them from going any further south. So, they just travel along that pattern. Uh, wiping them out, of course, as they go. The Israelites have them on the run. And the Israelites reach as far as Mount Carmel, and that's near, essentially, where Sisera lived 30 kilometers east, uh, west of Mount Tabor. So that's the idea. That's something you can have in your mind, but this is also very important. This is something that I wonder how it would have happened otherwise had our main character of the lesson today not said or thought what he did. Sisera runs away, but is killed in Yael's tent. Sis, uh, and this is, uh, this is how it plays out. So with that being said, now let's go back to the text. As we read portion by portion, and you can screenshot this that I just read for you, play by play, if you're interested. I want you to imagine yourself living in the moment and asking yourself, not knowing how the battle would take place, but you know that the Lord's on your side if you're following him. is essentially like Jericho giving you the victory. You've just got to do what he says as a people. But would you and I have had the faith to just do what God says and trust that he will work it out, even if you don't exactly know all the details? That's a good question. Well, stepping back, again, for lesson number one in this, I'm not going to read the text except sharing with you the background to get up to where we are. Lesson number one deals with the backstory even up to this point, and that is this. God had first called a man named Othniel to be a judge. After he died, Israel plunged back into sin and rebellion. They suffered again as a result of that, and then God raised up another man, a judge, deliverer called Ehud, and after he died, guess what? Israel plunged back into sin and rebellion. What's wrong with these people who should be representing God, not going against God? Application applies to the church as well. Judges chapter 4, that's where we are. This is where it begins. After Ehud died, verse 1, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So point number one, general rule one, without proper leadership, people will stray. They will follow the wrong course. That's just how things go. And yes, I do want to emphasize that, yes, we have the examples in Scripture that show any individual can choose to remain faithful to God, despite what others do. I hope you're that strong. But as a rule, people are fickle. And so when you have ungodly influences in positions of power, it only encourages the public to continue down the path of debauchery and destruction. People will stray. It's so important to have good influences and good leadership because sin is easy. Sin is easy. And righteousness takes effort, 
and endurance and commitment. So I want to say in this case, thank God for the church. Thank God for the church. As I've recently heard it shared in prayer, it's great to be around the people, the saints who make doing right much easier. And because humanity is prone to err, Ron quoted from Jeremiah this morning, and I love that prophet uh, to the southern kingdom. It's so sad, right before the fall of Babylon. But Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, he was so, so right when he said, it's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. That we depend upon God, the way he designed human life is so that we, through his shared word, can have that growing, maturing relationship with him. Constant guidance and maturity and maturing. So the Israelites suffered because of their willful rebellion. They just decided to say, okay, Lord, I'll follow my way instead of yours. And as a result of wandering down that road of unrighteousness, they suffered and, and they encountered a lot of opposition. They encountered a lot of oppression and tribulation, and that got their attention. And guess what? God is such a loving, merciful God that he would raise up judges to deliver them. Why? He was faithful to his covenant, even when they weren't faithful to his so lesson number two comes from verses two and three. So let's first read these verses and then make a general point from it. Verses two and three, chapter four. So the Lord sold the Israelites, that is allowed it to happen, into the hands of Jabin. This was a just call, even if it was by his hand. And a king of Canaan who reigned in Hazar, the commander of his army was Sisera who lived in Herosheth, Her Hagoim, because he had, here it is, 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Where were you 20 years ago? Think of how long that's been. 20 years. They cried out to the Lord for help, and the merciful God raised up a judge, raised up an individual to help them. And now point two, God's love is unconditional but his blessings can be. Now, this is what happens when I type an outline first and then work on my lesson. I just try to I thought, get an idea, you know, in my head. I say, Here's how I want to word it. You might want to write this sentence as a sub point. This will be how I share. If I ever share this lesson again, this is how I want to word it this way. Let's do better than that. God's love unconditionally endures, but his blessings are bestowed conditionally. Let's think about that. God will forever love the souls of those who are eternally separated from him. God loves, and his, God will eternally in love, and that's, that will endure. But the blessings are bestowed conditionally. It's always been that way. Think way back to Deuteronomy when they were being told again the law and the covenant that was made so that as they entered the promised land, they would be sure to be reminded of two things. Number one, God's covenant. God will be faithful to you and to what he has said, but you've got to follow him. He, they specifically got the warning again from God that they would receive the blessings only contingent upon their obedience and faithfulness. Because it's in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Let's go to Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 7, verses 9 through 11. Verse 9, God told them, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations. Then don't start counting the generations. That's a figure of speech, all right? God will endure as long as you're following him. Yes, to those who love him, it says, and keeping his commandments. But, here's the conditional word, but those who hate him, those who, that is, don't follow his righteousness, for all good reasons, as well they should, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Therefore, here's the conditional idea, an admonishment to us. He's behooving us. Take care to follow the commands, the decrees, and the laws I give you today. This is God saying essentially to the Israelites, I've got you to this point. Reverence me enough to obey me and follow me. I'm for you. Just follow me. And he is in that position to do so. He is the sovereign God, of course. But the Israelites as a nation didn't always uh, uh, follow. God's way is righteous. God's way is pure. And following it will bring blessing. But Satan's way 
uh, that goes against God's will will bring consequences if you follow that. If you stray from God, consequences will come. And only curses, as was emphasized earlier. I love that metaphor of the thorns represent the curse that came upon us because of sin. And that curse is upon Christ. Never thought about that, Ron. So as I look at this, I think about God's way brings blessings. And the Israelites kept straying from God's way. Deuteronomy now, chapter 8, just one verse, verse 19. Deuteronomy 8, verse 19. Notice the conditional word, if. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Well, this is his chosen people. God doesn't show favoritism. Yes, he picked a people to work through to bring about salvation for the world, but even they can't say, I'm a child of Abraham. It doesn't matter because if you're not following God's will, you're out. I appreciate that. Amen. So let's notice how this is still the case under Christ's covenant today. We hear so much emphasis of how Christ forgave all sins. He died for the sins of humanity. It needs to be clarified, lest it be misunderstood, directing people to the scriptures so that they will know what that all is about James chapter 4, verse 8, for example, notice this conditional word. If we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8, a bonus verse here. Ephesians 1, 8 teaches that all the blessings of salvation itself in context, all the blessings of salvation itself are found only in Christ. So the question is, what if we are not in Christ? That's how serious this is. That's why we take this commission so seriously. Tragically, many people believe that they will receive God's eternal blessings even though it is not His will that they are following. Isn't that incredible? Brethren, we need to do a better job explaining the gospel to people. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And that's, a power, you know, that's a powerful statement. It's so common we may forget how powerful it is. We live in a cause and effect world. That's just the way it is. There is an eternal principle woven into creation itself that has, yes, cause and effect in this world, but spiritual ramifications for eternity. So whether we sow to the Spirit for life or sow to sin for death, there are eternal effects. God will love unconditionally, but His plan by His great design and His nature of love to provide choice he will bless conditionally those who choose to follow God. That's the way life has been designed. So back to Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 4 now. Israel secures a good and competent leader to help set them back on the right path. In this case, she is a prophetess, one who is speaking on behalf of God, named Deborah. A man named Barak was commander-in-chief. Verses 6 and 7 now. This is where the drama of the story is uh, intensified. She sent for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, act like you're him right now, commands you, go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead the way to Mount Tabor. This is where faith and obedience is tested, of course. God says through her, this is what you do. He says, I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with the chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Okay. Everybody is different. I would have wanted more details, but I would hope that I would have followed through with the, okay, that's what you said. I'll do it. This is the instruction for battle. To someone who is probably aware of the logistics of war, Deborah says, Barak, you get everyone together, go to Mount Tabor, and Sisera will be lured and delivered unto you. Pretend like you're there and ask yourself, would you need more details, or would that be enough that you war by faith as a command from God? Well, verses 8 and 9 suggest that he may have not been thinking as he should. That's all I'm going to say right now. 
Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you won't go with me, I won't go. I don't know how long of a pause that was in the actual scene. We don't know that. But Deborah says, Very well, I will go with you, but... Now, to his shame, by implication, to his shame, future events just changed. How did, how did she foretell what was going to happen? Well, only God could truly know. So this came from God. She prophesied that a certain lady would now have the honor of conquering Sisera, and uh, it didn't happen like it may have otherwise happened. But here's the case. By request of Israel's army commander, Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. Here's a simple application for you. Lesson number three. Fulfill your God-given responsibility. What role are you in? Church member? Father? Mother? Wife? Husband? Grandparent? Whatever role you're in. Uncle? Aunt? Niece? Nephew? Fulfill your God-given, godly responsibilities in that role. Barak wasn't wanting just the encouragement of her presence. Who knows what he was thinking? But nonetheless, it's an... It's argued that he shouldn't have even wanted to put her in harm's way anyway. But regardless, and I'm saying regardless, his response somehow was still appropriate. Uh, let me know, inappropriate. And here's the question, why? Why was it not proper? Because Barak was in that role, the military battle-tested commander of the army. He was and had just received instruction from God's spokesperson. That should have been enough. The proper response would have been something like, May the Lord bless me as I carry out His word. But, back to the text. We do see that Barak and Deborah get to the battle scene and they gather the troops like God had commanded, so we have to give them credit for this. Verse 13, Sisera was down at the front of Mount Tabor with 900 chariots by the Kishon River at the foot of that mountain. Now, even though you have the high ground... <laughs> Even though you have the high ground and have the advantage, you are still essentially and easily can be surrounded. So would your heart be pounding a lot faster thinking, will I live to see the next hour? I don't know. Deborah and Barak. Deborah says to Barak this statement, Go, for this day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. This is prophetic past tense. It's a done deal. God has granted the victory for Israel, and they will follow the command strategy, the battle plan. And yet technically someone says, into his hands? Really? As a nation, that's technically true. It just would not be his hands, of course. Judges chapter 5, verse 20 later mentions the, the song of Deborah, and it references this idea that 10,000 Israelites charged down Mount Tabor, beautiful Mount Tabor, the slopes therein, and when we see the effects of that sudden rainfall, how that happened by God's hand, no doubt, the enemy chariots could not advance. They were stalled in the plains that were flooded of the Kishon River or valley. And God's battle plan to conquer the opposing forces and abandon their chariots of war is just mud. Only God could use mud and take down a world power. Isn't that something? There is much spiritual application of this. Remind me the odds again. Well, how many do they have? Yeah, it shifted odds in their favor. Lesson number four, don't let the enemy choose the battlefield or the battleground. Don't let the enemy choose the battleground. God lured Sisera to an, a place in his army where he knew that they would be rendered ineffective in a, such a simple way. But the application is if you don't stand on God's prescribed mountain, his righteous high ground, which is the word of God. If you don't stand on that, moving where he tells you to move, when he tells you to move, pursuing the powers of this world will lead to your demise. And only one blessing, also let me say it this way, one blessing in particular stands out with God's design for fellowship in the church. And it's a blessing that here at Oak Hill we, we see more than maybe even our whole lives. And I pray that that's the case for you. Accountability. Standing together encourages us not to venture into the valley of sin. Satan's forces would love to slaughter you there. 
but don't let Satan prematurely, that is, lure you into his turf in his way. Don't do that. Follow the Lord's battle plan. Wait upon the Lord. Do it his way and on his time. Application for us with whatever battle we're facing. For our final point and final scene, let's just build up to it a little bit. I hope you appreciate the power and the knowledge of God as we look at what's taking place. As your eyes are glancing on the text, verses 18 and 19, somewhere around there, uh, Sisera is on the run. Remember that arrow that went all the way back to the east? Sisera is on the run. He flees on foot to Jael, or Jael. And this is a, a lady who, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, he arrives at her tent... And, and she says, come on in. It's okay. You're safe here. Wow. She, he thinks she's an ally. She's not. Chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. She gives Sisera some milk and a blanket. Milk and a blanket after a hard day of battle. I'm telling you, this sounds to me like a deliberate recipe for rest in peace. Parental PG-13 disclaimer for the next 10 seconds, okay? After he fell asleep, she hammered a tent peg, threw his head into the ground. Filter lifted, right? Who would have thought that? Principal point for us. No matter where the ungodly run, those outside of God's will have no place of rest, no security, and no refuge. No rest, no security, no refuge if you're not under the protection of God. I'm about to read three verses from Hebrews chapter 2. And while I do, I want you to think about four things. Take all the knowledge you have of these four things and focus on them as I then read Hebrews 2, just a few verses, and then compare it to this account that we've read today. Think about the holiness of God, how He is righteously pure. Think about the sovereignty of God. He reigns over all things eternally. The holiness and sovereignty of God. Think also about the justice of God, the justness of God. His holy wrath will be directed against all uncovered sin. And think about the love of God, because He provided a plan for salvation. Now, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message, the message and I'm holding up the Bible for emphasis on that. Since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression and disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was first declared by the Lord and attested to us by those who heard. One of the greatest threats that we have, no, the greatest threat that we have are the consequences of sin, namely death. Our death and eternal separation by our sin. God is so holy, He just can't accept that sin, but He is so righteous and loving that He took care of that sin for us and has given us the option to receive that blessing far, far beyond what we could imagine. God wants us saved, and how is He wanting us saved? By grace through faith. Going back to where we began, grace through faith. It's always been that way. So I want to show you God's battle plan. That's God's battle plan for the greatest victory. His death to atone for sin, His burial, and His resurrection to prove He is the Lord of life and to be the first fruits of those who raise up out of their grave spiritually and eternally. So the penalty for human sin was atoned for by Himself in human flesh. His death in human flesh atoned for all human sin. God's plan for our redemption is also so wonderful, so simple, so simply wonderful, so wonderfully simple. Hear, believe, confess, repent, and be baptized. We know it well. Now notice the conditions. I normally don't do it this way, but since we're focusing on the conditions of, of salvation, 
These are some familiar verses. John 8, 24, if you say that you, um, I say that if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Because if he is the Lord, then that is a statement of truth. What if I don't believe in Christ, who is to be my Savior? Then I will be lost. Luke 13, 3, I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. We need to turn to God. We need to every day lean upon God and follow his will. What if we don't? Matthew 10, 32, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father in heaven. Uh, we make some uh, modern day applications that loses some context in this, but the idea is let people know who you are and whose you are and what you stand for and where you stand and what you're all about. C tell people about Christ and Christ will confess us before the Father. Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. He who doesn't will be lost. Well, what if I don't? I would then be lost. Galatians 3.27, Do you not know then that as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put him on? We're clothed with the righteous garments of Christ if we have obeyed him as he has said in faith, grace by faith. Well, what if we haven't? Well, then we're not in him. We are not clothed in him. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10, Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. These are wonderful promises built upon the condition of obedience. God's word will judge the world but give life to those in Christ. And the question is, will you follow God's battle plan for salvation by grace through faith? If this be the need that you have today, let's, let us help you as we stand and as we sing.